In the 19th century, Aotearoa shifted from a population which was virtually 100% Māori to one which was nearly 95% Pākehā. And while most of these Pākehā were British, they began creating their own independent culture after they arrived in New Zealand. These guys are often romanticised as pioneers bringing civilization to a wild frontier. But of course, that's not the whole story. The other side of this narrative involves concerted efforts to take even more land from Māori, which often caused complete disaster for tangata whenua. Ko li mārama McLaughlin tēnei. Ko William Ray tēnei. Welcome to the Aotearoa History Show. New Zealand's early colonists were mostly young, working class and overwhelmingly male. In 1873, men made up 70% of the adult Pākehā population. And these guys left a lasting impact on New Zealand's culture. Yeah, like, have you ever wondered why the stereotype of a Kiwi bloke looks like this? Social historian Jock Phillips argues this stereotype has its roots in what he calls the crew culture of early colonial New Zealand. These crews were teams of gum diggers, shearers, and bushmen. It was really hard work, and these guys took pride in that fact. Here's how a guy called E.W. Elkington put it. There is something grand in felling by your own exertions a giant Cody tree that towers overhead and spreads its great branches right and left. To see it totter and come down with a thundering crash, burying perhaps a dozen smaller ones at its fall, and then to be able to look at it lying at your feet and say, alone I did it. It makes the lifeblood tear through my veins. These men were bound together by their work. They often had to live together for months at a time in small, self-sufficient, all-male groups. They rejected the rigid class structures of England. In their world, anyone who worked hard, drank hard, and looked out for their mates could feel a sense of belonging. There's a lot to admire about these early pioneers, but there's some bad stuff too. Men were discouraged from showing any emotion. If you were feeling sad or lonely, you didn't talk about it. This attitude's still strong in New Zealand men today, and sometimes that can be a problem. People have argued it's part of why our mental health and domestic violence rates are so high compared to other countries. <laughs> Many men were doing the same work as E.W. Alkington, clearing native forests to make space for those white fluffy money bags we call sheep. Between 1840 and 1860, 20% of New Zealand's bush was cut down or burned. Then the government built new railways and roads which made it profitable to export native timber. So the deforestation accelerated into the 1900s. The decline in bird numbers was already obvious to settlers in the 1860s, but the real collapse began after 1880. Around this time, the government introduced ferrets, stoats and weasels to control rabbit populations, despite dire warnings from scientists of what those predators would do to our native birds. The most famous loss was the huia a bird considered especially sacred by Māori. The last living huia was spotted in 1907, and today we only know what it sounded like thanks to this recording of Henare Hamana, a Ngāti Pirau man who had learned to imitate the huia's call as a young boy. The huia wasn't the only bird that went extinct in these years. We also lost the laughing owl and the South Island kōkako. Other species like the takahe and kākāpō slipped to the very brink. I could go on, but you get the point. Lots more species would have gone extinct if the government hadn't set up the first few predator-free island sanctuaries. The government also created some forest reserves on the mainland. Those are the last few places you can still find Aotearoa's original bush today. So, having done all that hard work clearing the land, those men now wanted to buy some. And the government wanted that too. But they ran into a problem. There wasn't any land for sale. 
The government had stolen, confiscated or bought lots of land from Māori already, but pretty much all of that land had gone into the hands of a small group of extremely rich people who ran gigantic sheep farms. They used to call them sheep barons. Eventually, the government broke up those big farming monopolies, but first they went back to their usual method of getting more land, taking it from Māori. Māori were still living communally within their hapū. There was some new stuff like Christian churches and schools, but essentially life for them was the same as it had been for hundreds of years. Some had been pushed off their land by the New Zealand wars, but most were still living on the same whenua, which had sustained them for generations, tending to gardens, collecting kaimoana. But that was about to change. The government was about to make another big play for Māori land, and to do this, it created a new legal system, the Native Land Court. Justice Minister Henry Sewell said the goal of the Native Land Court was, quote, the detribalization of the Māori, to destroy, if it were possible, the principle of communism upon which their social system is based, and which stands as a barrier in the way of all attempts to amalgamate the Māori race into our social and political system. If you're wondering why the government was so keen to destroy the Māori social system, Sewell said it was to bring the great bulk of the lands in the Northern Ireland within the reach of colonisation. Māori were already under pressure to sell their land. New Zealand now had a cash-based economy. If a Māori farmer needed a new tool, they couldn't barter for it anymore. They needed money. And the only way to get money was to sell land. But according to Tikanga Māori, land was held collectively by everyone in their iwi or hapū. If this farmer wanted to sell some land, they needed everyone else to agree, and a lot of the time they didn't agree. For Māori, land is central to identity. Tangata Wenua literally means people of the land. The government saw collective ownership as an obstacle, so in 1865 it passed the Native Lands Act, which established the Native Land Court. Sometimes the court's judges carefully considered cases. They asked for evidence of ownership and consulted with Māori experts on tikanga and iwi history before granting ownership rights. But a lot of the time it was just first in, first served. Wanwano would race in to register their claim before someone else could get in first and sell their land from under them. Look, you might have a bit of land which supported 100 people, and 99 of them didn't want to sell. But if one did, then everyone was dragged into the court. And on top of that, the court would only recognise 10 owners for a piece of land, so 90 of those 100 people lost any kind of legal right to a say. The court pitted Māori against each other. It undermined the traditional tribal decision-making systems which bound them together, which is exactly what the government wanted. Also, because a lot of Māori were new to the whole idea of money, they often had no idea what a fair price was. This opened them up to a whole lot of dirty tricks. A common one was for a local shopkeeper to sell Māori lots of stuff on credit. Then, in the middle of winter, when those Māori didn't have any spare food to trade, these shopkeepers would demand payment. The only way to settle the debt was to sell land. The government also convinced Māori to hand over land with promises that they would build roads and schools for Māori to use as compensation. Often those promises, though, were forgotten as soon as the land changed hands. The result of all this was a massive transfer of land from Māori to Pākehā. In 1865, Māori had owned roughly 19 million acres of land. By 1909, 18 million acres of that land was settled by Pākehā. Plus, it was expensive for Māori to sell land. There were surveying fees, lawyers' fees, agents' fees, transportation and accommodation costs. Court hearings were usually held in Pākehā towns, a long way from Māori settlements, and could last for months. The Eastern Māori MP Wee Pere put it like this. In the case of the Native Land Court sitting at Cambridge, the natives had to come from Taupo and Oturua and other distant places. A company that supplied the natives with provisions charged for it, and the amount they had to pay equaled the value of the land. There was nothing left for the natives. So basically it cost them about as much to sell the land as what they got for it. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, what the hell happened to the Treaty of Waitangi? Wasn't the whole point of that agreement to protect Māori from unfair land deals? Well, again, 
the colonial government used the legal system to undermine Māori rights. One particularly nasty case involved a Ngāti Tua rangatira called Wiramu Parata. Ngāti Tua had gifted some land to the Anglican Church with a promise it would be used to build a school for Māori, but the church did not build that school, and the government decided it should be allowed to keep the land anyway. So, in 1877, Wiramu Parata went to the Supreme Court, arguing this was a breach of tetiriti. But the court decided that the question of whether this land deal breached the treaty was irrelevant. In his infamous ruling, Justice James Prendergast said, The whole treaty was worthless, a simple nullity which pretended to be an agreement between two nations, but in reality was between a civilised nation and a group of savages. Justice Prendergast said that Māori were simple barbarians, incapable of performing the duties and therefore of assuming the rights of a civilised community. Basically, the court said that Māori were too primitive to understand something so complex as a treaty, which meant the treaty didn't have any legal power. So Ngāti Toa's legal challenge failed. Without the protection of the treaty, Māori were squeezed into smaller and smaller plots of land, and without land to grow crops or livestock, they slipped into poverty. Disease ripped through impoverished Māori communities. If you were a Māori girl born in the 1890s, you had a 40% chance of dying before your first birthday. By 1896, there were only 42,000 Māori left in New Zealand. That's less than half the pre-1840 population. Most Pākehā politicians weren't worried about any of this. Many believe that Māori were an inferior people who would naturally die out after being contacted by the superior European races. There was a saying in the late 19th century that the duty of Europeans was to smooth the pillow of a dying race. These white supremacist ideas let politicians ignore the things which were actually causing the decline of the Māori population. Loss of land, poverty, unequal access to health care. Māori land loss in the late 19th century was mostly achieved through laws and courts, but the government still used force to push Māori off their land. The most famous example was at a village called Parihaka. Parihaka was founded by pacifist Taranaki Māori towards the end of the New Zealand Wars in 1866. The most famous were Te Witi o Rongomai and Tohu Kākahi. By the end of the 1870s, Parihaka was the largest Māori settlement in the country. It had its own police force, bakery, bank. 1,500 people lived there, and they were mostly free of the poverty and disease which devastated Māori in other parts of the country. The town became a rallying point for Māori who opposed unjust confiscations and unfair land sales. But Parihaka sat on top of land which the government had declared confiscated from Māori after the Taranaki Wars ten years earlier. Now the government wanted to hand that land over to white settlers, but Te Witi and Tohu refused to go quietly. The tension built. Settlers destroyed fences built for Māori livestock. But Māori asserted their mana whenua by ploughing up fields and they removed the survey pegs. The government cracked down. They jailed hundreds of Parihaka Māori without trial. But the community refused to back down. They also steadfastly refused to turn to violence. As Te Whiti said, Though some, in darkness of heart, seeing their land ravished, might wish to take arms and kill the aggressors, I say it must not be. Let not the Pākehās think to succeed by reason of their guns. I want not war, but they do. The flashes of their guns have singed our eyelashes, and yet they say they do not want war. Eventually, about 1,500 armed men marched on Parihaka. Riding at the front of the column was the Native Affairs Minister, John Bryce, a farmer who'd led troops during the New Zealand Wars 12 years earlier. Bryce was expecting armed resistance, he had cannon and mortar aimed at the town. It could have been a bloodbath, but the leaders of Parihaka decided not to respond with violence. Even as Tohu was being arrested, he told his followers, even if the bayonet comes to your chest, do not resist. And the people of Parihaka listened. Here's how one police captain described the invasion of Parihaka. 
That attitude of passive resistance and patient obedience to Tefiti's orders was extraordinary. There was a line of children across the entrance to the big village, a kind of singing class directed by an old man with a stick. Even when a mounted officer galloped up and pulled his horse up so short that the dirt from its forefeet splattered the children, they still went on chanting. But things didn't stay peaceful for long. Within a few days, the troops started looting Māori homes and raping women. A few weeks later, the order was given to destroy the village. The troops burned and pillaged Parihaka and 180 square kilometres of surrounding farmland. The people of Parihaka were left facing starvation and forced to accept work building fences and roads for European farmers on the land the government confiscated as punishment for their rebellion at Parihaka. Some prisoners were kept locked up for years after the raids. They were forced to work in what was effectively slave labour. Several died in jail. The Parihaka raid is often seen as the ultimate symbol of the Crown's aggression toward Māori, even after open war had ended. In recent years, steps have been taken towards acknowledging the injustice. There's been official apologies to iwi affected by the raid and millions of dollars of compensation paid. But those payments don't come anywhere near close to the value of the land confiscated. Pacifist resistance was just one method Māori used in response to the colonial government. Kingitanga continued to use its collective power to negotiate directly with the government to return confiscated land. There was also another new pan-tribal movement called Te Kotahitanga, which set up a national Māori parliament to counterbalance the Pākehā-dominated colonial government. Te Kotahitanga tried to introduce bills and laws to give Māori more of a voice in the political system but those efforts were mostly ignored by Pākehā politicians. So some Māori took a different approach and tried working inside the Pākehā system. Apirana Ngata was a significant figure in both movements. He was a member of Kotahitanga, but he also set up a group called the Young Māori Party. Initially, this was a group of old boys of Te Aute College, although the membership expanded later on. The Young Māori Party included people like Māori Pōmare, Te Rangi Hiroa, also known as Peter Buck. These guys were highly respected by many Pākehā as well as their own people. Some of these men became Māori MPs and spent their careers lobbying to reform the Native Land Court and for better health and education services for Māori. They had some successes, but it was hard to overcome resistance from Pākehā politicians. They also did their best to preserve Māori culture while encouraging Māori to make use of European innovations. Apirana Ngata put it like this. E te puerea mō ngā rā o tau ao. Tō ringa ki ngā rā kau a te Pākehā, hei ara mō tō tīnana. Tō ngā kau ki ngā taonga ao tūpuna Māori, hei tikitiki mō tō mahuna. Grow up, tender youth, in the time of your generation. Your hand reaching for the Pākehā tools for your physical well-being. Your heart dedicated to the treasures of your ancestors as a plume upon your head. Ngāta and other members of the Young Māori Party tried to find a compromise between Māori demands for independence and Pākehā demands for assimilation. It was a difficult path, and one of the most controversial elements came in the early 20th century. Because one way members of the Young Māori Party tried to gain respect from the government was by encouraging their people to fight alongside Pākehā in a war which claimed more New Zealand lives than any other. Next episode, we'll be telling the story of the First World War. Thanks for joining us on the Aotearoa History Show, produced by RNZ and made possible by the RNZ New Zealand On Air Digital Innovation Fund.